Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word in the scriptures that speaks to us so clearly about the gospel of the Lord Jesus that is such good news for us. And we thank you especially on this day as we remember the resurrection of Jesus, that it is good news for all, that there is hope, there is life after death in eternity with you, there is forgiveness of sins. Help me now to speak of this very clearly and faithfully and help us all to hear and to take your word in, to think about it, to take it into our hearts, to believe it and to live by it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go to the next slide. Great. The western coast of Turkey is a rather beautiful place. Um, there's lovely beaches, there's the Aegean Sea. In the Aegean Sea, there are a whole lot of islands that are quite desirable locations, and one of them is a small island called Patmos. Patmos is only about six times the size of Lidcombe, so you get a bit of a picture of it there. Well, today, if you've been partying a bit hard on some of the other Greek islands, you'll go to Patmos for a bit of serenity. As I said, small, there's only about 3,000 people who live there. And as compared with some of the other islands that are party islands, it's a place you choose to go to when you want to just relax a bit in the sun. Now, at the end of the first century, Patmos was not a place of choice for a man called John, but it was a place for which he had been forcibly taken as an exile. Listen to John's own words. This is in verse 9. He says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So the writer identifies himself as John, so far as we work out, this is the Apostle John, one of the 12 original followers of Jesus. He's the man who writes the fourth gospel. He writes three letters in the latter part of our New Testament and the book of Revelation. Ah, the book of Revelation. It's the last one we read, isn't it, as well as being the last one in the Bible. For many of us, we find it a book that is confusing, disturbing, <clears throat> and it's a source of divisions and arguments amongst Christian people. Look, a great way to read the book of Revelation is to read it in the original setting. You've got this man, John, and there are seven churches over in Western Turkey, and he loves the people in those churches, but he's in exile on Patmos. And so he does what a pastor might do. He writes a letter to encourage these people. He knows that they are going through a tough time because they are Christians and he writes to encourage them just to stay loyal and to hang into Jesus. Well, we're not in Western Turkey or Patmos. We're not at the end of the first century, but we are followers of Jesus like the recipients of this letter. We are followers of Jesus and we live in sometimes difficult and challenging circumstances. So let's see what John has got to say to us about following Jesus, about being exiles for Christ. Slide. When John and his readers looked around them, they saw a challenging world. So far as we can work out, this letter was written <coughs> around 96 AD. On the throne, the imperial throne of Rome, was a man called Domitian. Now, many people saw this emperor Domitian as a revived Nero. Nero was the dreadful emperor under whom Peter and Paul were executed. Nero, just one of his oddities, he had a senate that he had to deal with. And he made one of his horses into a member of the Senate. Now, we might think in Australia there's some odd people make their way into our Senate in Canberra, but surely to having a horse as your senator takes the cake or rather takes the hay. <laughs> this Domitian, from one viewpoint, he was a good guy as an emperor. He was strong emperor. He had public work things, public work uh, projects. The value of the Roman currency rose under him. So if you were a tourist, 
you were glad for the rising dollar, as it were. He was also known as being ruthless and authoritarian. Now, that meant that he didn't like anyone who rivaled his authority and prestige. And that brings us to the pesky Christians who by then are widespread through the Roman Empire. These pesky Christians, they confessed Christ as being more important to them than the emperor. And they spoke of God as being the king of kings, the lord of lords, if you like, the emperor of emperors in perpetuity. Most people in the empire would go along with the delusions of divinity and grandeur that Domitian had. But the Christians wouldn't go along with it. They'd pay their taxes, they'd obey the laws, they'd pray for the emperor, but they're not going to go along with the delusion of divinity that many of the emperors had. And that made people like Domitian very cranky. One writer of the time records that his hatred of God was as great as that of Nero. Nero's the benchmark in depravity and hatred of God, and Domitian comes next. So Domitian doesn't like these Christians. And so in the days of John, there was sporadic, localised persecution in what we call West Asia. That hurts. It hurts today when Christian people are ostracised, in prison, their business is shut down, their family excluded from access to schools and medical facilities, and the church persecuted. That hurts today, and it hurt back then. So when John's readers looked around them at the world in which they lived, they saw a Roman emperor who appeared to rule the roost with an iron hand that he used against the church. That wasn't the worst of us. The external persecution of the church was matched by another set of problems inside the life of the church itself. Now, unless you are a pretty insensitive person, you know that every church, excluding Grace Point, of course, every church has its share of internal problems. Every church we read about in the New Testament was like that. Every one of the seven churches that John writes to had internal problems. So there were some of them, Ephesus, Sardis, Laodicea. They'd started off red hot for the Lord, but by now it's like lukewarm water out of your hot water tap in the bathroom. does no good one way or another. There were other churches where there were people who professed to be Christians, but clearly weren't. That's Smyrna and Philadelphia. And then there were churches inside the church. Instead of having a pulpit that was faithful to the word of God, there were churches where there was false teaching in the side and from the podium. That's Pergamon. And matching the false teaching, there were churches that had wrong, sinful, immoral behavior inside the church. Always it is true in the history of the church that the greatest problems facing of the church are not the ones that come from outside, but the ones that are inside. When the church is persecuted, initially it tends to be thinned out somewhat as nominal people flee. But then the church gets stronger. As one of the earlier church fathers said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. But as for the problems inside the church, amongst people like us, they're like a cancer that just eat away at the vitality of the church. Now, if you were one of the faithful people in one of John's churches and you looked at all this, you looked around and saw the emperor to mission, you looked at the problems inside the church, I reckon you get pretty discouraged. And you'd be asking some questions. Well, we're told that God is good and all-powerful, Gee, when I look around me and see Domitian, and when I look inside the church, is God really good? And is he powerful? And as for that stuff I hear in the sermons about how Jesus is the risen, ascended one on the throne, well, if Jesus is on the throne, why is everything so rotten down here where we are? So the view from below in the day of John was rather dismal, and we can imagine there are people who think about giving up on Jesus. What about us? Maybe some of us face the same temptation to give up on our loyalty to Jesus. Globally, in much of the world today, to identify as a Christian is to put a target on your back. 
Um, I've got a pastor friend in Pakistan. His name is Ezekiel. On his clothing, he's got a big red cross over his heart. He really has made himself a target for someone to take a pot shot at him and know exactly where to aim. To be a Christian in most of the world today is to have a target on your back. And of course, globally, the church is troubled internally by the same sorts of issues that we see there in the churches that John writes to. And so we hear of spiritual bullying by church leaders. We hear of moral failure within the church, sexual exploitation, financial corruption, false teaching, and on the list goes. It's not quite like that in Australia, is it? Well, maybe it's more like it than we think. We in Australia are not persecuted in the way that some are. Uh, sometimes you hear Christians complaining about increasingly we face a tough time from other people in Australia. Look, just get out of Australia and get into the rest of the world. Then you'll learn what persecution is. But we do face an increasingly challenging external environment. There are plenty of people who regard our message about Jesus as being bigoted, intolerant, hate speech. And on top of that, there are emerging threats to religious freedom in Australia. One of the uh, roles I have as moderator general is to share in meetings with other heads of churches and indeed in uh, approaches to the government from the leaders of different Christian faiths. So in the last couple of weeks, I've been involved in a couple of joint letters to government and some meetings with government ministers on freedom for faith issues. And there is no doubt in Australia, there is a rising tide presently of inquiries and reports by bodies such as the Anti-Discrimination Authorities, the Productivity Commission, and down the pipeline are coming a range of threats to religious freedom in Australia. So we, like the first readers of John's revelation, face an externally challenging environment. And of course, we have got the same internal problems to the church as we're there in the seven churches John writes to, and as we see in the rest of the world. And on top of that, if you look around the Christian world today, the church is absolutely booming in Africa, in wider Asia and Latin America. And then we look at Australia, and there's not many churches like Grace Point that are running out of buildings. Rather, we've got churches that are closing down because of diminished following. Well, that's the scene we see which is not identical to the scene that John saw, but nor is it dissimilar. External challenges and internal problems. Now, we need to notice how John writes to the church. He doesn't say, don't worry, be happy, sing that 15 times over and you'll feel better. He doesn't deny the reality of the internal and external problems. What John does is he gives us the view from above. So his readers see the view from below around them. What John does in this book, he gives us the view from above. It's as though the door of heaven is opened and John gets a glimpse into what is happening in the realms unseen. Let's illustrate. Um, if you go to Sydney Airport on a busy day, the end or the beginning of the school holidays, there are people and trolleys going everywhere. Your bags disappear on a conveyor belt. Who knows where they're going to finish up? And then you might go and look out and see the planes. There's planes pulling out of landing bays. There's planes coming in. There's planes taking off on the different one ways, planes coming down. It appears to be chaos. But then someone takes you up into the control tower. Up there, it is quiet. It is calm. There are people who know what they're doing. They're doing what they've been trained to do. And you, in fact, see that the appearance of chaos is deceptive. Good people are in charge and ensure that everything is working. That's where John takes us in the Revelation. Most of the book of Revelation is set in the heavenly places where we see that God is on the throne, that Jesus is Lord, and Satan is a pitiful bully who's been defeated. Let's illustrate. Uh, Revelation chapter 12 fills this out, the picture of Satan as the defeated bully. It's a football match. It's the last five minutes. 
one team is behind by 30 points, five minutes to go. What do they do? They start the punch up in frustration. They're about to lose. That's the picture of Satan thrown out of heaven because he's been defeated and he comes down on earth in order to wreak havoc on the church. Totally different from the picture we might have of Satan from where we are. So that's where we're going today. We're going to the view from topside. And the big message here is that what we see around us is not even half of the story. Now, today we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, which in many ways, it's the end of the gospel. So all four gospels end with the resurrection, although some of them pop the story about the ascension in. But the resurrection is not the end of the gospel story. It's a pivot point where we go to a whole new chapter. So let's go on the next slide to the top side view. First up, we are given a reminder about the God in whose name we gather today. Bad emperors like Nero and Domitian, they come, they go. And so do, well, insert here the names of whatever tyrants you might have in mind in our world today. They come, they go, and someone else replaces them. But as for God... God simply is. And so we've got the words in verse 4. He who is, who was, and who is to come. Again, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God. The first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet. The beginning and the end. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, who is who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And it's Augustine, one of the early church fathers, that remi who reminds us that God is called the Almighty for one reason only, because he can do whatever he wants to do. How encouraging it is to have that. God was, is, will be, and who is Almighty. John's world and ours are not in the hands of petty despots. It's not the bad and the bad who run the world, but it's God. Now, if we turn over to Revelation chapter 4, maybe that's your reading this afternoon. I'm going to give you a few passages to read. Revelation chapter 4, we get a glimpse into the throne room of God in the heavenly places. It is a scene of remarkable majesty. You might have watched some of the uh, coronation service last year for King Charles. British grandeur at its best to bring in the tourist dollars. That was like the installation of school prefects as compared with the scene in the throne room of God in heaven. It is majesty beyond majesty, showcasing our God as the forever almighty one in his majesty. Now, as if the picture of God in the throne room in Revelation 4 is not enough, read on in Revelation chapter 5 where John now zeroes in on Jesus. His picture is not of a bloody corpse being carried off to the Institute of Forensic Medicine and then over to Rookwood Cemetery. Rather, the Christ whom John sees, indeed left for dead and buried, but then he's risen. That's what we celebrate today. Not only arisen, but he is ascended. He reigns and he is returning. There's the creed, Christ, dead, buried, risen, ascended, now reigning and yet returning. And so John in verse <coughs> in 1.5 says, He, Jesus, is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. Christ is exalted above earthly rulers. Now, do you notice both in the description of God and in the description of Jesus, we are reminded with God, he is the almighty one, can do whatever he pleases, compared with Nero or Domitian. And here with Jesus, <coughs> that he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. Very intentionally, I think, in the description of God and of Jesus, the readers who are suffering under this bad Roman emperor Domitian, they are being reminded that Domitian is not one who has absolute rule. It is God and Jesus on the throne. And what's this Jesus done for us? We read, it's he who loves us. 
the one who shares the throne and the glory of heaven. He's loved us and he's freed us from our sins by his blood. And he's made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. Now, if you know your Bible well, you'll know that that language of being priests and a kingdom, it arcs back to Exodus chapter 19. God has brought the Hebrew people out of Egypt and the event we know as the Exodus. Moses, the one through who he does it. They come to Mount Sinai and God makes what we call a covenant with the whole of the Hebrew people. God has already saved them. And then he says, out of all the people on the face of the earth, you, you will be my treasured possession. And that's where the language of kingdom and priests for the people of God first kicks in. The nobody people becoming really somebody people through the mercy of God. Revelation chapter 5 as I said, it expands our picture of Jesus. We get a scene in heaven where everybody's kind of wringing their hands because there's a scroll, and that scroll holds the key to human history. No one can open it. And then this lamb turns up, and the lamb is the one who can take the scroll and he opens it to unlock God's plan to reconcile all things in Christ. And then as Revelation 5 records it, I mean, the crowd in heaven just go ballistic as they realize what's happening. God rules. Jesus is risen. Jesus reigns. And it is God's plan that will govern the universe. As I say, the heavenly crowd goes ballistic. We even read that the elders start kind of falling on their feet. I mean, Presbyterian elders falling on their faces in order to give praise. John summarizes it as in chapter 1, verse 6, to him, that is to Jesus, be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Do we get it? Christ has won the battle against sin and death. Christ is risen. Christ reigns. Christ is the present reality of the Lord of the universe. That's the picture we get when we go into the control tower in the heavenly places and we see the flip side to the view from below. The church of John's day, as we've seen, like the church of today, when we look from below, we see a church that's weak, that's troubled, that gets kicked about. That's real and it hurts, but it's not the end of the story. So, so far we've got Jesus, Jesus dead, buried, raised, ruling, but that's not the end of the story. Verse 7, John says, look, he's coming soon with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. The Bible speaks here and elsewhere of the day when Jesus will return in visible glory to the world that rejected him. For people of faith, and I'm guessing that's most of us here, for people of faith, that is a day for us to pray for. And indeed, the very last words of the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, have this prayer, Maranatha. It's a prayer we should be praying on a regular basis. Come, Lord Jesus, come. So it's a day for us to pray for when Jesus will return. It's a day for us to with which we can long. I mean, when Jesus comes, we're going to run into his arms for a welcome hug as everything is made as it should be. Can we imagine that day? I mean, Rookwood Cemetery over here, there are hundreds of thousands of graves there. On the day when Jesus returns, there's going to be this great rattling of bones as those who died believing in Jesus are raised from the dead. And when that day comes, when Jesus returns... Those who believe in him, we will be home at last. You know, the whole Bible from Genesis chapter 3 on, the whole Bible has got a theme of home and away. You and I were created to be at home with God in the Garden of Eden. Through our stupidity and rebellion against God, we wanted to live life our way. Because of that, we were thrown from the Garden into exile 
as God's just judgment. And from Genesis 3 on, the whole of humanity lives like Abraham as a somewhat homeless people wandering and living broken lives in a broken world. But for those of faith like Abraham, we seek the city that is to come. And then home. Uh, Revelation chapter 21, 22. Have a read of that this afternoon as well. Revelation 21, 22 gives us a glimpse of what God's new creation will look like. I mean, evil's gone. Everything's at rest. I mean, the hospitals around us here in Sydney, um, mental health facilities, all of these kinds of places, well, they're going to be noodle and dumpling bars, aren't they? Cemeteries, Rookwood over there, going to be one giant open air park where we'll kind of throw frisbees and praise God and ha all the rest of it. And as for the Institute of Forensic Medicine down the road here, they're not going to be handling corpses and trying to figure out what happened. It's again going to be a place, a noodle bar, whatever you'd like to imagine. It's just going to be wonderful beyond words. Some years ago, I was driving in northwest New South Wales on a Sunday morning and just came across a beautiful scene. The road in front was clear, nice green hills. Um, there were woolly lambs, cattle, just a beautiful scene. And I remember thinking how good it was and then thinking God's new creation after Jesus returns. It's going to top that many times over. We should encourage one another with just how good it's going to be. On that day when Jesus returns, we get the welcome hug from him and then the world is as it should be. There's a dark side to that day. There'll be some people for whom our homecoming day will be a day of unrelieved horror. As John puts it, there'll be people who on the day Jesus returns, there will be a wailing beyond anything we hear in Gaza or from Ukraine, Ukraine, or a place where there's been a natural disaster. On the day Jesus returns, there will be widespread mourning. Philippians chapter 2 tells us that every knee is going to bow before Jesus. For people of faith, we will bow before Jesus in glad gratitude, acknowledging our saving King. Others will bow their knee before Jesus as prisoners of war who've just realized they're on the wrong, they were on the wrong side of history and who suddenly realize that they are on the wrong side of the creator of the universe for an endless eternity. That's the wailing that John speaks of. On that day when Jesus returns, God will be glorified in his justice as the moral order of the universe is asserted and the faith of people like ourselves is vindicated. It will be an awesome day beyond anything that we use the word awesome for. For people of faith, the day of Jesus' return will be absolutely awesome, but it will be the kind of glad awe, whereas for others, it will be an awe that is one of wailing and horror. And all of that encourages you and I, down here, in our version of Western Turkey, with the problems external and internal, knowing all those things and the view from above, it encourages us to just plod on and keep our faith in Jesus. Let's illustrate. Maybe you've had this experience, you've been away on a long trip, you're now on the homeward journey. Um, alas for you, some of your flights are being cancelled, you miss some connections, who knows where your bag has gone and you're in the middle seat in row 72 on a budget airline. But you're heading home. And the knowledge that you're heading home keeps you motivated to plot on, chase those missing connections, do with the missing bad. The knowledge that you're heading home encourages you to hang in. So how do we live now being down under but living in the light of the view from top side? Slide. So we're thinking now about how we live in the present with the reality we see around us. Key words are that we are to live with enduring faithfulness to God in Christ 
on the basis of God's assurance and promises. We're to trust God's word when it gives us assurances and promises. Listen to the word of assurance that Jesus gives us. This is a little later in chapter 1, verses uh, 17, 18. Jesus says to us, Hear this as a word to you. Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. Now look, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and haze. What a wonderful word of reassurance that is this Easter Sunday. Jesus is alive and he's got the keys to our greatest enemy, which is death. Now listen to the promise. Chapter 2, verse 7. To the one who conquers, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, if you know Genesis chapter 3, you'll know that there was a tree there called the tree of life. And Adam and Eve, after they sinned, they were expelled from the garden, lest they eat of the tree of life. Because had they eaten of the tree of life at that point, they would have lived forever under the judgment of God as sinful rebels. But when Jesus returns and you and I are home at last with him in the new creation, as a people who've been chosen, called, justified, sanctified, and now glorified by God's grace, you and I will get an invitation card to go and take and eat of that tree of the fruit of life that we might for live forever in the presence of God. So there's the promise to those who persevere in faith in Jesus, the tree of life is ours. Every one of the seven churches that John writes to gets a version of that promise in different words, but it all adds up to the same thing. If you hang in with me, the good stuff is all there ahead for you. They needed that word of reassurance and promise, and so do we. As we've seen, our view from down under is not dramatically different in kind from theirs. We too need to remind ourselves that Jesus is risen, that Jesus is on the throne, that he will return, and that one day we will be home at last. So let's hang in, folks. Persevering faithfulness, I think, is the peak virtue of the Christian life. Whatever else we do as Christians, our calling is to hang in with Jesus. Keep trusting the sufficiency of the gospel. Keep living in the way of Jesus. Keep telling other people about Jesus and keep worshipping God alone. Let's remind ourselves of that often, of that view from topside. God is almighty. God is all good. Jesus is ascended. Jesus is reigning. Jesus is returning. Home is waiting. Let's remind ourselves of these truths often. And that's a really good reason for you and I just to keep on keeping on in the Lord. Let's bow our heads for a moment. I'd like you to, before God, ask two questions. And then I'll pray. First question, what's the big or significant thing that gripped you today? What's the big or significant thing? It might be there's a new truth you've encountered today that's somehow grabbed your attention. Or it might be something you've heard before, but in a new way, God is impressing it on you. What's the big learning for today? Write it down if you like. Next question, what are you going to do with it? See, learning is for living, not for learning. Learning is for living. So what are you going to do to actualize that significant thing that God's put before you? What's the plan for turning learning into living? I'm going to pray. Gracious God, we thank you that in your kindness you've given us this lovely book of Revelation written to people like us who are struggling and 
just hanging on some of us. We thank you for the huge encouragement we've seen today that you are the Almighty. It's not Nero, it's not Domitian, it's not someone else. We thank you that you are the Almighty and we thank you that Jesus is reigning even now and we thank you for the certainty of that day when he will return and bring us home. Help us to hang on to that hope, we pray. Amen.